All right. Uh, any questions from today or comments? Chris. Um, I was just wondering why God put a, a tree of good and evil in the garden. Yeah, that's a great question. Why put the tree there in the first place? Um, the tree represents what is. Just as the, the other trees represent God's abundant generosity, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil isn't an insert of evil into the situation, but a recognition of a situation. In that as soon as God is the one who determines what is right and wrong, as soon as he has made a people in his image who have freedom and choice, the option of rebellion exists. It's, it's the nature of any time you provide something good, the fact that something good has been provided now brings a reality of not having that good. So nobody missed having a smartphone until they were invented. But now smartphones are invented, there is now the possibility of somebody wanting a smartphone and stealing one or having it in the wrong way. So the, the, the reality of having good creates in its absence or in its twisted when it's twisted the capacity for it something to be bad so by god providing what is good and the superabundance of the garden there is already the option for adam and eve to choose for themselves what is right and what is wrong so god was not planting evil it was just the acknowledgement that humanity had a choice are we going to trust the god who's given us everything to set the boundaries of what is good and evil or are we going to take for ourselves um, the assumption or presumption that we ourselves can choose what is good and, and evil. Yeah. yeah, great question. Any other questions? Yes, Chris, it's okay to have multiple questions. That's fine. Um, I was just wondering whether by the time, by the old, te the New Testament, when you talked about man and woman being equal, it seems like sometimes in the New Testament, I'm, I mean, I know that culturally in the Jewish culture they didn't see women as equal to men, but sometimes in some of the things that I suppose Paul says or people would criticise Paul for mm. is that he doesn't seem to see women equal either. Yeah. Yeah, very much so. And part of the struggles that we have is that often we approach a text with a presumption that uh, women are treated as less valuable than men. We also approach text with the presumption that different roles give different people different value. And so when we read Paul carefully, we realize he is maintaining certain roles which are different without implying that a woman is inferior to men. He does talk about the weaker sex, but that's talking about being vulnerable in that culture and space in terms of physically not in terms of being less valuable. Now, particularly in the Ephesians church, there is a lot of mess taking place. We need to read Ephesians in corresponding with 1 and 2 Timothy, uh, potentially even Titus. But when we read Ephesians with 1 and 2 Timothy, we realize that the Ephesians church has a lot of mess going on in that church. I think I'm thinking Ephesians, yes. Um, and there, there's a problem with uh, very disruptive women in that community. There's also a situation of men who are teaching, taking on their teaching role, but doing so in a corrupt, corrupt manner, and in fact, uh, leading these disruptive women astray. And so when we read Paul's teaching, uh, we need to take that whole context of what's happening in the church in Ephesus in, into account. Um, he's addressing a particular issue, and so it comes across very strongly, because we then don't uh, we often forget the fact that he talks about his co-ministry workers and he names women in that list. He talks about them as um, being um, co-responsible for home churches with their husband, Priscilla and Aquila. So we, we must take the whole scripture, particularly from a particular context, and realize we are quick to see suppression of women. But what we need to be aware of is often we're importing and understanding from our culture. In fact, Paul might be addressing the abuse of women in a particular church, um, particularly men who are teaching a false gospel and preying on women who had given in to their, into their um, pursuit of pleasure, particularly in the Ephesians church. So in that context, he's had to use very strong language to stop some of the stuff that's happening there. Uh, the Corinthian church is another church where that takes place. 
But if you look at a church where he's very positive about the church, you look at Philippians, he has a, a very different tone. Uh, it's a very, very positive because um, he's not combating a, a dangerous situation. So it, it's really hard for us because we tend to see roles as defining value. Um, and remembering also that what was taught in Genesis was completely countercultural. Women, the husband has to value the wife above his own parents. This is just astounding. And it does take people a long time to get that sorted. And then what do we read next week in chapter 3? The man is going to oppress the wife and the wife is going to rebel against the husband. It, that, we, we, this is going to be a result of sin. Um, so that's actually seen as a negative, not as the desired outcome. So throughout all the scripture, we're actually trying to return the marriage relationship to what it should be that was so lost in the fall. All right, gorgeous people, it's really hard for us as a church to understand how pers persuasive or pervasive is our cultural understanding of gender, marriage and relationships. And it can be very hard to approach the scriptures from a... We, we always approach the scripture with baggage. But as we keep reading the scripture, we let, allow it to shape the way we view the world and the way we view the Bible. It's a kind of this spiral or this cycle that we go to scripture, it shapes us a little bit, and then when we re-approach scripture, we can read it better. It shapes us again and we go back to it. The issue of gender and marriage and relationships is one of those areas where we need to allow the scriptures to shape our thinking. Um, and we need to be very careful to avoid any of that kind of um, oppression or subjugation that people who have abused scripture or used it as an excuse to, to, as, to repress women. Everywhere the gospel has gone into a new society, everywhere without fail, the living standards and the rights of women and children have improved. You can track it all through history. It's embarrassing. All right, so let me, let me reassure you that the Christian worldview, even though it can be hard because we're hearing so many other voices out there, actually works it's not surprising because it's true. <laughs> it's the way God's designed things to work. All right? And again, a helper is not a diminished role. Remember, God is defined, described as the helper most often in the, in the Old Testament. It's not a, it, we, we mustn't read into it our cultural bias that the helper is the lesser. It's just that the man on his own was not enough. He, he needed to be completed um, in terms of community for the creation ordinances that were there. Okay. This doesn't mean you have to get married. All right? to, to be singleness is a gift of God too. And the Bible talks about that elsewhere. Uh, but in terms of the creation mandate, um, marriage, we're, we're talking about here. So please also don't read this and think you're not complete if you're not married. That's not the implication of, of this account either. Okay, That's an important thing to notice as well. You're not made complete when you're married. That's a different issue.